Welcome to podcast number 32 in my series, Colonies to Colossus, The Rise of a Giant. In this podcast, we're going to look at fortifications in colonial North America. I'm going to start this podcast by looking at the basic science of fortification building before gunpowder weapons were used in warfare. We'll then look at how gunpowder changed the science of fortification building and how the science of fortification building was often modified to accommodate the wilderness conditions of the North American continent. The terminology associated with fortifications mostly comes from the French language, which is true for nearly all areas of military. This is because during the late 1600s and early 1700s, France became a military superpower for a time, and the other nations of Europe, including England, adopted French methods in modernizing and organizing their own military systems, including the French words associated with it. The science of building forts and fortifications remained unchanged for millennia. It was simple. Thick stone walls, the taller the better, was a winning formula. These made it hard for an attacking army to climb over or batter their way into the fort. Sometimes obstacles, called outer works, were added to make it hard to even get near the walls. The Romans were excellent military engineers who sometimes built very effective and deadly outer works. On the screen now is a cutaway section showing some of the deadly traps the Romans sometimes built that an attacking army would have to get through just to get near the walls of the fort. Let's say an attacking army is coming from the right side of the screen. The first thing that they would encounter were iron spikes or hooks which were sharpened on their tips and in their front. They were designed to catch the foot of an attacker as they rushed forward towards the walls. And if you tripped and fell, you impelled yourselves on the other ones. Meanwhile, the men behind you rushing forward would trample you even further and trip on you and a pile could build up. The Romans called these stimuli. You might also encounter sharpened tree branches set into the ground. Or you might encounter small little stakes set into small holes and arranged in a pattern that the Romans called lilies. There were also trenches with pits and spikes at the bottom, sometimes filled with water. Keep in mind that the whole time that an enemy army is picking their way through these deadly traps, the Romans are raining down arrows, spears, boulders, and any other thing they can on the attackers. On the screen now is a generic medieval castle, like one you might find somewhere in Europe. Tall walls and towers gave defenders a huge advantage. Not only were they hard for attackers to climb over, but archers on top of the towers and walls could rain down arrows on attackers, and it was not easy for attackers to shoot arrows back. You'll notice from the diagram that the tops of the towers protrude a little bit beyond the edge of the tower wall itself. This was so that defenders up there could throw down boulders, boiling oil, hot sand, glowing bars of metal, logs, etc. on anyone attacking the walls of the towers through the little openings that were in the bottom of the overhang. On top of the walls and towers are tooth-like stones. These were called crenellation. This gave some place for defenders to hide behind. Often there were shutters between these crenellations that opened downwards so that archers could fire down at attackers and then have something to hide behind. On the screen now is an overview of a simple medieval castle. The gray area surrounding the castle is a moat or trench. This trench made it difficult for attackers to get near the walls because they had to climb out of it first to actually attack the walls. Meanwhile, archers on top of the walls are raining down arrows on you. Sometimes the moats were filled with water, which was diverted from nearby streams or lakes. Castles were often built near lakes or rivers because it protected one or more of their sides from attack. Also, building a castle on bedrock, especially on a hilltop, made it even more effective because it was harder to undermine that way. Castles worked best when the forest around it was cleared for a better field of fire. This allowed the archers to see and hit targets that were away from the castle walls. Notice in this diagram how the towers protrude beyond the walls a little bit. This gave them the ability to rain down arrows on people attacking the walls themselves. When gunpowder was introduced in Europe, it didn't change things on the battlefield right away. It took time for Europeans to develop gunpowder weapons that were effective and safe enough to use because sometimes in the early times they would explode. But once effective safe weapons were developed, it changed everything. Tall castle walls and towers became a nice target, and castle walls weren't really designed to hold cannons or other artillery. With gunpowder weapons, castles became a liability. They were no longer effective as a fortification, and a new kind of fortification would be needed. On the screen now is an overview of the kind of fort that replaced castles. It's a rectangular-shaped fort with diamond-shaped bastions in the four corners. These were strong points that filled the same purpose that towers filled in castles. This kind of fort has many important differences from a castle. There are no tall walls or towers. These walls are relatively low, many of them about 7 feet, so that they aren't big targets for cannons. The walls of these kinds of forts are often made of simple dirt, 
Stone or logs were often used to case the tops and walls of these forts to give it strength and to keep it from turning into a pile of mud during a rainstorm. But it turns out that simple dirt is actually a very good type of fortification material because it absorbs cannonballs so easily. The gray area surrounding this fort is a trench dug for the same purposes that moats surrounded castles. The little brown lines on the inside of this trench are abatis. That's what they're called. These were sharpened logs or branches that were stuck into the dirt to make it difficult for attackers to get out of the trench and to attack the walls directly. So why is a fort like this more effective against gunpowder weapons than a castle? It's all about the geometry. For one thing, a cannonball is much more likely to glance off of a highly angled surface. And because these types of fortresses are not very tall, they're harder to hit in the first place. On the screen now is a depiction of a fort being attacked and it reveals one of the reasons that this kind of fort was so effective. The small blue ovals are attacking infantry trying to take over the fort. The red lines represent the paths of musket balls, cannonballs, and grape shot being fired by defenders on the walls. Notice that the firing right into the front of the attackers, as represented by the short red lines, only hits a few attackers, while the firing into the flank or side of the attackers, as represented by the longer red lines, hit several attacking soldiers all at once. This is called enfilade fire. A single cannonball will take out as many men as are hit by it, making enfilade fire devastating. Notice how often the paths of all the red lines cross, creating devastating kill zones. So the shape of these forts made it impossible for an attacker to attack without suffering enfilade fire. In more elaborate forts, additional structures, called ravelins, were added to protect the flat curtain walls between the bastions. These were connected by little bridges to the main fortress and added an extra layer of defense. Because these forts resembled stars, they were often referred to simply as star forts. On the screen now is a cutaway section showing an additional structure used to protect star forts called a glacius. It was a sloping dirt berm designed to be high enough to block attacking cannonballs from hitting the actual walls of the fort. The slope allowed defenders in the fort to still fire at attackers with their cannons. The glacius also made the trench deeper and more difficult for attackers to get out of once they fell down in there. Those of you familiar with modern tanks know that the front part of the tank is called the glacius plate. On the screen now is an aerial photograph of one of my favorite and most historic forts in the United States, Fort Ticonderoga. It is located in New York State at the southern end of Lake Champlain where it connects with Lake George. It was originally built by the French and called Fort Carillon, but was later captured by the English and renamed Ticonderoga, which is an Iroquois word which means between the two waters or where the waters meet. Fort Ticonderoga has been the scene of lots of history and important historic events and battles. Looking carefully at Fort Ticonderoga, you can see that it has many of the features we've been describing. It's star-shaped, it has ravelins, except on its south and east sides because the slope is too steep going down to Lake Champlain. It also has low, thick walls studded with cannons. The walls are only about 7 feet high and 14 feet thick. We've looked at the big formal star forts, and there are certainly a number of these which exist from northern Canada all the way down into Florida, but these were far outnumbered by the smaller, less formal types of fortifications that were built in frontier settlements. Frontier settlements were not able to construct formal forts or complex fortifications. Even if they did, they probably wouldn't have the manpower to really man them well. And this brings us to the blockhouse. In many frontier settlements, some buildings, often more than one, or houses were reinforced with extra wood to act as a place of refuge during attack. These were generically called blockhouses. The one you see on the screen is a little more of an advanced and well-planned model of a blockhouse. It had thick walls which made it impossible for musket balls and arrows to pass through. It may have had bunks for a permanent garrison too. It probably had a fireplace and stores of food and supplies. Some of these even had small artillery pieces. Their only real weakness is that they were vulnerable to artillery. But in the frontier areas, it was hard to get artillery back there. So most of the time, these settlers were worried about raids by Indians or in the case of New England, by French and Indian attacks during the many wars they had in which case a blockhouse was pretty good defense. And with the unlimited amount of wood that was supplied by the endless forests of North America, these were pretty economical and easy to build. On the screen is a simple fort made out of sharpened logs. They look a little bit like sharpened pencils, called the stockade. This particular fort features a blockhouse at one end for added strength and security. Little holes or loopholes were cut into the walls of these log forts so that defenders inside could shoot out at attackers. 
And more sophisticated versions of these stockades sometimes had bastions where they could mount small pieces of artillery. Many frontier towns were surrounded with this kind of fortification, and against an enemy that didn't have artillery, it could be pretty effective. Although sometimes a fire arrow or setting them on fire could mean that it was a death trap for defenders inside. But it was a cheap and economical way to build fortifications. In fact, in the 1600s, Virginians built a log stockade wall running through Williamsburg that was about six miles long between the James River and the York Rivers. Basically, this sealed off the entire peninsula against Indian attacks and kept livestock from roaming. While these kinds of forts were basically cheap and easy to build, relatively speaking, they did have one big problem, and that is that the wood rotted, especially if it came into contact with dirt, and it needed frequent maintenance and replacement of rotting logs and so forth. On the screen now is an overview of a simple stockade fort with two block houses and two of the corners. Some forts may have had as many number of block houses as they could build built into the walls. This gave them added strength and protection. In some ways, this fort resembles the castles that we looked at earlier with block houses serving as the same function as towers served in castles. They also dished out enfilading fire against an enemy attacking the walls. Many frontier forts did resemble castles in their basic layout, And these could be effective because it was hard, at least at first, to get artillery into the backcountry. So you didn't have to worry about it as much. You could afford to build something a little bit like a castle. On the screen now is what I would generically call an Indian stockade. There are early drawings of an Indian village surrounded by a log stockade similar to this one. This kind of fortification was probably adequate against small raiding parties. I really have no idea how common these were, though. I assume that in the frontier setting, you might want to put one of these up if you needed instant protection and then later replace it with a stronger log stockade when possible. I want to talk now a little bit about some of the fortifications that are a little more obscure and don't get mentioned very often. On the screen is a depiction of a chevaux de frais, which is a French phrase meaning horses of Friesland, which is a province in, in the Netherlands where wooden spiked obstacles were used to stop cavalry. These chevaux de frise on the screen, however, were designed to obstruct rivers or to stop ships on the river. They basically consisted of a big log box with three pointed logs sticking out angled through the top. You took this out into the place in the river where you wanted to deploy it and then filled it full of boulders so it would sink to the bottom. And hopefully the spiked beaks, the the spiked logs had little metal beaks on the tips. These would be just below the waterline so an unsuspecting ship would hit them and it would rip open their hull. As the first ship crashed onto these, the ones behind it would have to stop or slow down. And then shore batteries on the shores could then fire at the ships at very close range doing maximum damage as they all slowed to avoid impaling themselves on these things too. The Americans had some success using these on the Delaware River about 10 miles south of Philadelphia right near where the Philadelphia International Airport is today. At that time it was underwater. It was part of the Delaware River. The Americans also tried to use these to block the Hudson River which was extremely strategically important and to keep the British out of there but they weren't really able to. For one thing, the Hudson River is much deeper than the Delaware, and sometimes gaps between these things would exist, and the Americans would sink old ships to fill in these gaps to make it difficult for the British to navigate through. But in the end, the British were able to pick their way through these things, and they weren't really very effective. I think if given more time, the Americans could have improved on these and made them a very effective type of fortification against British ships. One of the other interesting kinds of fortifications that Americans used to stop the British on the Hudson River were these giant chains that they strung across. The idea was that if you strung a a large chain across the Hudson River, British ships would have to stop, and when they stopped, they would then be hit and pounded at point-blank range by shore batteries that would have really good accuracy because of the closeness. One of these giant chains was deployed at Fort Montgomery across the Hudson River. At first, they had some engineering problems with it. The tidal pressure of the Hudson River is pretty great and actually snapped the chain twice before they figured out a way to put it in place without it snapping due to the tides. The problem was, though, that the chain was no good if the enemy controlled the forts on the shores. That's exactly what the British did. They had shore parties go ashore and capture all the forts near their Fort uh, Clinton as well as Fort Montgomery. And with those under control, they could just simply take their time cutting the chain and getting ships up the Hudson River. And that's exactly what happened, unfortunately. On the screen, you can see a depiction of the Fort Montgomery chain. It was about five or six miles south of West Point and about 45 miles north of New York. These chains could be an effective type of fortification, but they were a lot of work and they were expensive and there were a lot of maintenance problems. 
For one thing, to put the chain across the river, you had to build a bunch of log rafts to rest the chain on. Otherwise, the weight of the chain into the water would pull it out of its moorings on the side of the river. And the logs in these rafts had to be replaced from time to time because they become waterlogged and no longer buoyant. Because these chains were made out of iron, they corroded in the water over time too. And the chain had to be removed from the river each fall before the river froze. And then later you had to redeploy it in the springtime when the thaw came out. So there was a lot of maintenance that went into these and expense. You had to have a small fleet of good ships and men that could man them to deal with the chain and to maintenance it. With the lessons learned from the Fort Montgomery chain, a better constructed chain and plan was installed at West Point. It was a bigger, heavier chain, and it was deployed in a better place. You can see it there on the screen where it was. As you can see on the screen, it was a much better location because as a ship approached the chain, it would have to slow down in that tight turn, so they wouldn't have the momentum to ram the chain. As the ship slowed down, artillery mounted in the forts and along the shores would be blasting away at the British ships. All of the chain links in this chain were made at the local foundries, which consumed an acre of trees a day during manufacture of the chain. I think it's amazing they actually produced this chain. It really is a monumental achievement. On the screen now is a depiction or close-up view of how the chain system at West Point worked. The links in the chain each weighed about 114 pounds, and they averaged about 31 inches. Some were shorter, some were longer. A Continental Army surgeon that was stationed at West Point described how the chain rested on large log rafts. He said, It is buoyed up by very large logs, about 16 feet long, pointed at the ends to lessen their opposition to the force of the current at flood and ebb tide. The logs are placed at short distances from each other. The chain carried over them and made fast by staples. There are also a number of anchors dropped at proper distances with cables made fast to the chain to give it greater stability. You can see from the diagram that in addition to the chain itself resting on these log rafts, there was also a boom of logs that stretched in front of it. This allowed people to virtually walk across the lake and it also protected the chain in case a British ship tried to ram it. It would have to get through two barriers instead of one. These logs were linked together by a smaller chain system. Benedict Arnold, who was commander of West Point at this time, and who was also secretly plotting with the British, was hoping the British would attack this chain, and he wrote, I am convinced the boom or chain thrown across the river to stop the shipping cannot be depended on. A single large ship and heavy loaded with a strong wind and tide would break the chain. Interestingly, the chain was never tested in combat. The British never attempted to attack it. They were distracted by other things. There are links from this chain today that are still on display at West Point. And pieces of the boom that were in front of it are also on display at Washington's headquarters in Newburgh, which is on the Hudson River, about 10 miles north of West Point. For further reading on this topic, I recommend the following books and articles. Forts and Firesides of the Mohawk Country, New York, Stories and Pictures of Landmarks of the Pre-Revolutionary War Period Throughout the Mohawk Valley by John J. Vrooman. The Force of Colonial North America, British, Dutch, and Swedish Colonies by René Chartrand and Donato Spedlieri. Castles, Their Construction and History by Sidney Toy. The Medieval Castle, Life in a Fortress in Peace and War by Philip Warner. Life in the Castle in Medieval England by John Burke. The Forts of New France in Northeast America, 1600 to 1763 by René Chartrand and Brian Delph. A Roman Fort by Stephen Johnson and Mark Bergen. The Evolution of Weapons and Warfare, by Trevor N. Dupee. The Battle for Gaul, by Julius Caesar. Chaining the Hudson, the Fight for the River, and the American Revolution, by Lincoln Diamant. Forts of the American Revolution, 1775-1783, to by René Chartrand. A Battlefield Atlas of the American Revolution, by Craig L. Simons and William J. Clipson. And... A New Look at an Old Wall, Indians, Englishmen, Landscape, and the 1634 Palisade at Middle Plantation by Philip Levy. Published in the Virginia Magazine of History and Biography, Volume 112, Number 3, 2004.